Good morning. Welcome to the Havilland EU's event, the Digital Services Act in Parliament. What next? By way of introduction, the Havilland EU provides political intelligence, monitoring and research to organisations across Europe, helping to understand the ins and outs of Bellymont and beyond. I am Robert Blackmore, the digital leader of the Havilland EU, and I'll be chairing this event this morning. As we all know, in December 2020, the European Commission, after successive delays, published the Digital Services Package, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. The twin proposals represent an overhaul of rules that currently govern the European digital economy, many of which derive from the now two decades old e-commerce directive of 2000. This event will of course be focusing on the Digital Services Act and namely its passage through the European Parliament. With the proliferation of illegal and indeed harmful content and goods online, as well as the transformation in the way companies can communicate to their audience through targeted advertising, many legislators are keen to build on the European Commission's proposals to develop digital rules fit for the digital age. Three months on from the Commission's proposal, and with the focus firmly on the European Parliament's role in DSA's legislative process, I'm very happy to be joined by our expert panel. Firstly, we have Sabina Verheyen, MEP. We also have Alex Ajus Saliba, MEP. However, he is running a bit late and will hopefully join us in the next 10 minutes. And of course, Emmanuel Bizzori from FTI Consulting. Over the next hour, this event will explore the key issues and contentions that will form the basis of the European Parliament's work until December 2021, when it is expected that the plenary will vote on the adoptions of the Parliament's mandate prior to inter institutional negotiations with the Council and Commission. We also hope to provide insight to stakeholders, both in industry and civil society, of how they can best inform MEPs over the next nine months in such a multifaceted and vital file. Indeed, perhaps we will ascertain which parts of the file MEPs themselves would benefit from further clarity. In terms of structure, each of our panellists will deliver a five minute opening statement. This will be followed by questions from myself and of course yourselves in the audience. Indeed, I wish to invite you to place any questions you may have in the Zoom chat box below, and I will endeavour to put them into our panel over the next hour. Finally, in terms of housekeeping, I'd like to remind you, following the conclusion of this event, the discussion will be available to Havlin social media and YouTube channels. So without further ado, I'd like to open the floor to our panellists for their five minute opening statements. Sabine Verheyen is a German politician who's been serving as a member of the European Parliament since 2009. She is a member of the Christian Democratic Union, part of the European People's Party, and is chair of the Culture and Education Committee and Rapporteur for its Digital Services Act opinion. She has also produced opinions as Rapporteur on intellectual property rights that is relevant with artificial intelligence technologies, as well as shaping the digital future of Europe, removing barriers to the functioning of the digital single markets and improving the use of AI for European consumers. Additionally, she is a member of the Special Committee on Foreign Interference in All Democratic Process in the European Union including disinformation. Over to you, Sabina. Thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me to this event this morning. I think we are dealing with a very interesting and very important issue as we had in the past, uh, several pieces of legislation dealing with the digital uh, era. And um, uh, the problem is uh, that we need uh, also a kind of uh, holistic approach uh, that is uh, uh, not just divided like, for example, the copyright directive and all these directives or AVMS and others, uh, which are implemented uh, in a, a very different ways in the single member state, but we need core uh, a legislation uh, that uh, is uh, the same all over Europe. So it's easier for really a digital single market. And that was very important that we came up uh, with uh, this new pieces of legislation uh, in the uh, Digital Services Act and the Digital Market Act, um, because I think uh, we need it. Uh, we must ensure that the basic principles of the social market economy remain valid in the digital age. And the biggest platforms have become bigger and bigger in recent years without getting really better. Uh, that is something we, we must assume. Fair competition means that new companies can enter the market and that consumers have a variety in what is on offer and not a concentration uh, like it's sometimes uh, seen uh, at the moment. It is also about uh, time that we hold online platforms more accountable. Uh, you mentioned that I'm a member of the Inga Committee, the Committee for Foreign Interference, and we saw in the past many cases where platforms played 
active or passive, more passive, uh, a role in, in these disinformation strategies. The new rules must help to stop to sp uh, the spread of illegal content and hate speech online. And we uh, want clear standards across the EU for how social media networks like Facebook, Twitter, but also others should deal with illegal content on their platforms. And this must also apply to uh, coordinated disinformation campaigns on social media that threaten our democracies. Users, on the other hand, must be empowered uh, on the internet. Uh, we therefore demand that the platform set up effective and rapid counterstatements uh, as well as complaint procedures. And the new rules must create legal clarity for all parties involved. And it's clear that larger platforms must be subject to stronger control than small and medium-sized companies. And what's also very important for us, especially in the cult committee is uh, that existing uh, sector specific legislation uh, is reflected uh, in the new legislation and that there are no contradictions or double burdens. For example, when it comes to media that uh, is already under a control, under a responsibility, which already have editorial responsibility and the, uh, um, are controlled by the media uh, uh, authorities in the several countries and also by ARGA, that there is uh, in the end out of the new legislation, not an additional control via the platform, because uh, double control, I think, uh, is not necessary and um, an undue burden. So we have to take a look very concrete uh, how the legislation should look like. We cannot hear you. I'm so sorry. Thank you very much, Sabina. And now um, if we can move on to uh, Emmanuel for his opening statement. I'll just uh, briefly introduce Emmanuel. Uh, he is a director within FTI's consulting technology, media and telecom practice in Brussels, which he joined in November 2018. Within the TMT practice, Emmanuel leads the online platforms cluster, thanks to his experience working on liability rules for online platforms. Before joining FTI, Emmanuel was the EU liaison officer for ICOM, the Institute for Competitiveness, which he joined at the end of April 2018. Please, Emmanuel. Thank you very much, Robert, and good morning to everyone. Um, maybe also to complement what you just said, a few words on FTI, it was a, um, which is a global advisory firm. Um, I also think it's important um, to start these remarks by making it clear that although we have a variety of clients um, that follow the debate on the DSA proposal, um, I will be speaking, uh, what I will be saying today reflects only my personal uh, views, and I think it's important to stress that for the sake of transparency. Now, going back to the main points of today's event, first of all, the responses to the stakeholders to the to the DSA proposal, but also to touch upon the um, topic of where the industry will be able to contribute to the DSA proposal um, in the next few months. Um, let me start with the with the first point, and I want to stress. I think it's important to keep in mind that the. DSA proposals are mixed reactions among various stakeholders. As a matter of fact, it is probably worth differentiating between tech and non-tech stakeholders. But even when it comes to the tech stakeholders, responses have been mixed. Um, that depends on variables such as geographical location, business model, five, 10 years um, um, strategies. I do think, however, that there was a common ground and probably uh, one could say that the lowest common denominator of the response of the tech sector to the DSA proposal was the call for a proposal that was built upon the principles of the e-commerce directive, a proposal that um, was a regulation for something meant to promote harmonization, which is something that MP Ryan just mentioned uh, right now, and I think it's something extremely important, but also for legal clarity. Now, when it comes to the position of the non-tech stakeholders, responses have also been mixed. Um, probably we're considering three sets of um, stakeholders, which can provide some illustrative cases of um, their responses to the, to the DSA, starting perhaps with the brand owners, who also following up on the experience of voluntary initiatives, such as the memorandum of understanding of counterfeit goods, have been advocating for measures um, to counter the spread of counterfeit goods. Um, therefore, so they've been calling for more um, obligations for online marketplaces in particular. Publishers, very similarly, have been advocating for measures to reshape their relationship with big tech, mirroring 
what happened very recently in Australia with the news media bargaining code, but also following up on the debate on the copyright directive, as MEP Varian just mentioned. Um, I think it's also important to consider the position of NGOs and civil society organizations more generally. Um, I am afraid I will have to, for the sake of clarity and, and brevity, uh, probably oversimplify something which is extremely important, but NGOs have been advocating from a general perspective, so provisions to um, better protect fundamental rights and also uh, address business models which are based on data use. Um, now, going back to the second point of the of the second point I wanted to cover before giving the floor back to you, Robert. Uh, where can the industry contribute to the decision making process? I think that the the European Parliament did a tremendous job last year with the trio initiative reports. Um, one of these was um, developed by MEP Saliba. Um, now that the proposal was published, it would be important for the industry to contribute on the details of the proposal. The devil, when it comes to tech policy and when it comes to the DSC proposal in particular, the devil really is in the details. And I guess that probably what the industry in general should do, but also NGOs and what everyone should do, is really providing some technical data, empirical evidence that can be helpful to the MEPs, um, but also to the, to the council and to the commission to develop something that can be future-proof and, and can resist the test of time like the e-commerce directive did. And I will probably stop here for the moment. Thank you, Manuel. That was um, absolutely fascinating. And I've got plenty more questions to put to you, and I know you're going to give some fascinating answers in the next Looking 40 forward. minutes. Um, we're still waiting um, for Alex, so I think we'll just crack on with some um, questions um, now. And if I remind you, please do put any questions you may have into the uh, Zoom chat box below, and I'll endeavour to get them across to our panellists over the next uh, 45 minutes. But Sabina, I, I would like to start with you. We have many SMEs in the audience today. Do you believe they may find themselves perhaps overburdened with some proposed obligations, for example, with the notice and action mechanism um, in the Commission's proposal? I think it's very important to make clear that we want to have uh, different approaches when it comes to small and medium sized enterprises and the big platforms, because the impact uh, is different when you are have a small platform with a small audience or uh, uh, which has not a, such a high societal relevance, I think the burdens should not be overboarding. And that is something we will take really care uh, on in the legislative process, uh, that we make exceptions for uh, small, medium-sized enterprises or for startups, or uh, uh, try to reduce the burden uh, for the smaller enterprises. It should not be a legislation that hinders development and uh, uh, new companies, but it should help to have clarity and fairness on the market uh, and uh, in the services. And that's the reason uh, why we have to take really a, a careful look into the detail. And uh, like you already said, the devil is in the detail and we have really to be, uh, uh, to be aware uh, that that should not be a, a burden that kills uh, engagement in new business models and uh, that must be open and uh, to have a bigger openness is also our uh, our aim. So uh, the um, obligations and the burdens for small and medium sized enterprises should be less uh, than for the big platforms that, that can afford such mechanisms in, the, in, the, in a good style. Thank you, Sabine. And to you, Emmanuel, obviously the last few years we've had the, uh, the GDPR, uh, which was a hugely uh, controversial and um, high profile piece of legislation that saw huge public engagement with citizens, businesses and civil society reaching out to the MEPs across the, the duration of the file. Do you get the sense the DSA will spark a similar kind of response going forward? Indeed, do you think it already has? Most likely. I mean, I think that, you know, the DSA will indeed spark a lot of uh, public engagement um, similar to, to what happened with the GDPR in the in the previous legislative term. Um, I think that on the basis of our own experience, it was clear from the summer of 2019 when the, the general public was starting to be made aware of the DSA proposal, that this was something, this was something that was going, to be, um, was going to capture a lot of media attention, generally speaking. Um, and I think that probably there are three reasons um, why 
this is the case. Um, I guess that the first reason has to do with the fact that the DSA is so relatable. So many stakeholders, and as a matter of fact, probably everyone who is in this virtual room today um, has experienced firsthand some of the matters the, the DSA deals with. Um, in this context, again, the awareness raising job that was done by the European Parliament with the own initiative report um, was essentially a catalyst to um, raise awareness on, on the fight. Probably, I would say that the second reason why the DSA is going to receive so much public engagement has to deal with its international dimension. Um, I, I remember that just before the proposal was published, uh, we, within FTI's online platform cluster team, we developed a mapping that was summarizing the different liability regimes in Europe, in France, and in Germany, but also at European level, and then in Japan, in the US, and in the UK. And what analysis, what our analysis unveiled was that whereas a regulatory change was on the horizon in all these jurisdictions, um, the EU was really working on something concrete and was really working to set the standards, the set, to set the international standards. Again, this is where the parallelism you just drew, Robert, is very interesting uh, with the GDPR, right? Um, and probably the third point um, has to do with something um, M.F. Varane mentioned in her introductory remark, uh, which is in the previous legislative term, we saw so many sectoral initiatives such as GDPR, um, the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, the Terrorist Content Online Regulation Proposal. Um, all these sectoral initiatives sparked national debates. We need to keep in mind that in some member states, these debates are still active um, currently. And this probably just contributed to a general public awareness of the importance of the proposal. Um, so I think that probably these are the three reasons why we are likely to see a lot of um, engagement on the DSA proposal. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, and Sabine, just sticking on to sort of the, uh, you know, the legacy of GDPR, are you finding there's been similar kind of engagements um, as an MEP. Obviously, you were, you were an MEP during the whole debate around GDPR. Are you, are you feeling similarities in terms of the, the feeling amongst industry and, and civil society? Um, I, uh, I think the discussion is more on a, on a factual basis at the moment. Mm. Uh, with the GDPR uh, 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 discussion, it was very high emotionalized. Uh, we had some uh, also fake informations based on, on, on first drafts, uh, which could not be uh, taken out of the public discussion, even the text was changed already uh, uh, for a long time. Uh, that was uh, a different kind of discussion than we have now. Um, I think uh, it is important to deal with the facts, uh, what is in, uh, also to have a very intensive exchange with all kinds of stakeholders, with the users, with the consumers, with the uh, platforms, and also with the service providers on the platforms uh, really to get to get a picture uh, how the ideas which we have and the principles which we have in in offline in the offline world can be transposed and transformed in a technologically neutral and future proof uh, uh, way uh, in the new directive because we have societal agreements uh, uh, on fake, on uh, hatred, on illegal illegal content, and this must be somehow transposed. And uh, uh, I think what what was already done is that we uh, went away from the, the pre uh, controlling to the notice uh, and action procedures, uh, which uh, are not uh, uh, pre selecting, but uh, uh, um, in, at uh, at uh, at post, not as ante ex ante, like we had had it already in the audiovisual media services directive. And I think coming from the cult committee. Uh, which had uh, responsibility on AVMS, and, and uh, we were also very uh, strong included in the discussions on the on the uh, uh, copyright directive. Um, I think it was very important for us also to 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 protect the diversity we have uh, in Europe, and uh, I think that is also something that has to be in, reflected in the Digital Services Act, uh, that it helps to to get it to to keep and and save a diverse environment environment for content, for uh, uh, services, uh, and not to concentrate just on man mainstream in the end. And I think that is very important that must be reflected. Uh, but the discussion as such 
um, at the moment was more which com uh, committee is responsible in the end for the legislation. We had big discussions between the committees who has uh, which competence can talk about. And what we have to keep in mind is that this is a piece of legislation that is uh, um, uh, uh, kind of a holistic approach so that every committee that has a say in uh, different facts uh, must also be included in the discussion process. And so it is the same with the stakeholders. So we need uh, all the stakeholders on, uh, at the table to discuss um, uh, ways how to, to do it best to, to, to uh, reach the aim uh, in, a, in, a, in a technical, but also legislative uh, fitting uh, way. Thank you, Sabina. And I would just like to welcome um, our second or our third participant today, Alex Adjus Saliba. Um, now, Alex, thank you for joining us. Um, so we've been discussing um, in the last 50 minutes about SME obligations, um, which I will come to ask, ask your view on in, in just a moment, and also looking at the sort of the, the discourse with GDPR and the similarity to the current discourse between the um, Digital Services Act. And perhaps if I can just introduce you and your background, and then um, I can invite you to make your opening remarks. So Alex Adjus Saliba is a Maltese member of the European Parliament, the Labour Party, since 2019. He is part of the Socialists and Democrats group. Alex has become a leading parliamentary voice on digital issues. Indeed, he was in charge of the Internal Market and Consumer Protection Committee's own initiative report on the Digital Services Act prior to the Commission's proposal. He's also a member of the Petitions Committee and a substitute on the Committee on Employment and Social Affairs, as well as the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence on, in a digital age. And I invite you, Alex, to, to make your opening remarks. So first of all, thanks for this invite and sorry for being a bit a bit late today, but although we're working from home this week, it's still a bit a bit busy, busy also for us in our constituency. The DSA and the DMA topics are topics which are very close to my heart, as you said also in your introductory remarks. I have worked directly on them as, as rapporteur for the Internal Market Committee initiative, the Internal Market Committee within the European Parliament, which is the primary committee dealing with these two important um, initiatives being undertaken by the Commission and published uh, last December, December the, the 15th. And therefore, although uh, I, I am not a rapporteur or, or shadow for these two initiatives um, for, the, for the legislative work now that will be undertaken in the next weeks uh, and months, I am still continuing to, to, to follow closely and definitely will also be giving my input in the, in the amendments stage of uh, the both uh, DMA and DSA initiatives being undertaken by, by our committee. Basically today we are living in a digital world where search engines, social media platforms are increasingly playing a central role both in our social and also in our, in our economic lives. And the platform economy and digitalization are becoming key instruments in bringing people in, in bringing businesses together. They help facilitate social and commercial exchanges of goods, services, information, which would otherwise not have happened. And the importance of this infrastructure was witnessed more heavily during the pandemic restrictions that we have been facing now for more than a year where our reliance on e-commerce, our reliance on these uh, public utilities, I like to call them public utilities because they are public utilities. Ultimately, without this infrastructure, especially during the periods of restrictions, we would have, uh, we would definitely not have lived as normal as uh, we basically lived during the past, during the past years, because ultimately this infrastructure helped us to communicate, to exchange goods, to, to buy online. So it was of fundamental importance. But this, this, this ecosystem is not only important during a pandemic, but definitely will continue to grow, will continue to take a more central role in our lives, even the post-pandemic. Online platforms still, although they have the positive side effects, which no one can doubt still, raise also new policy and also regulatory challenges to which it is really important for us that we must react. And this is why the timing for these initiatives are so important. 
Here, basically, we are also dealing with a revision of a 20-year-old piece of legislation in the EU dealing with, with e-commerce, and therefore, it is important for us to update our uh, legislation to be uh, in touch also with the new realities that, that, we are, that we are living. And some of the platforms have also witnessed meteoric, meteoric growth and now are causing great concerns when it comes to marketing dominance, when it comes to widening, widening of the information and also power asymmetry, power asymmetry between platforms, citizens, businesses, and also regulators alike. And the digital transformation has also profoundly changed the functioning of the global economy and also societies. And unfortunately, the existing legal framework needs updating updating, as I said, after 20 years. After 20 years, when, because 20 years ago when the e-commerce directive came into being, some of these important and fundamentally important platforms that basically we cannot live without today, 20 years ago didn't even exist. So it's really important to have this framework of legislation which takes into account these latest development, this, this meteorotic growth, uh, and also the reliance that our citizens, our users have for these platforms. And these two pieces of legislation now create a new legal framework regulating digital services, including online platforms, and importantly also marketplaces, because there, uh, I think that we should focus more because we have a number of issues. And they are doing so by creating a digital environment built on trust, built on choice, built also on a high level of protection for our consumers, users, but also small and medium-sized enterprises. The DSA and the DMA should protect and safeguard citizens and consumers' rights and guarantee a better, a safer digital environment with real, tangible rules in a virtual world, which basically has no borders. And I here come to basically one of the most important pillars also with the Parliament's recommendation, the recommendation of creating a level playing field for the offline and online world. That which should and must be considered to be illegal in the offline world should equally be considered to be illegal uh, also in the online world. And this level playing field with the current legislation with the current protection that we are awarding to users, consumers, citizens, SMEs, uh, is still not being achieved. And with the ambitious proposal of the Commission, although we are always trying to find uh, and, and, and find the details, but I believe that with the <clears throat> proposal of the Commission, we have uh, a step in the right direction to try to achieve this um, level playing field. Therefore, it is fundamental that the key, key priorities of the European Parliament, the SA report, basically achieving this level playing field, achieving important principles such as the know your business customer, the special liability regime for online marketplaces, better protection for our consumers when they use not only marketplaces, but when they use the digital services per se. These should be uh, achieved in, in, in the legislation that we are discussing. And online harmful business models, manipulation, discriminatory practices designed specifically to maximize user attention dedicated to uh, the platform-based uh, information based on illegal sensationalist content need to be adequately uh, addressed. Because here ultimately, and this is also one of the most important points in our, in our report, is that of addressing particular business models. And uh, with the know your business cust customer, with the stricter standards, for example, for advertising, for targeted advertising, digital nudging, micro-targeted, recommended systems for advertisement, preferential treatment. We believe that all these proposals can ultimately tackle harmful business models so that we create a safer online, online environment. And as I said, I welcome the uh, 15th of December initiatives on the DSA and the DMA that the Commission has moved forward. These proposals definitely will be a game changer for Europe and also not only for Europe, but as 
I always say this will be uh, a game changer for internationally for uh, a wider a wider market, not only for the EU market, because ultimately here we are definitely be influencing not only Europe, but we will ultimately our our initiatives will ultimately also have a ripple effect uh, in other continents. Like when we were ambitious with the general data protection regulation, and other continents, other uh, regulators, legislators also followed followed suit. And to conclude, they definitely there is no one size fits all approach that we can fit in the platform economy. Economy also giving the variety of different platforms that we have, different particularities. A broader discussion is definitely needed and action in the platform econo economy is necessary and fundamentally important to create a market built on trust, a market built on choice, a market built, built on high consumer protection level. In, in other words, a citizens driven platform economy that genuinely benefits businesses, but also consumers alike. Thank you, Alex. Um, perhaps I could just bring you back to what you mentioned earlier about the know your business customer principle. But there's been some suggestions that in fact, it's not gone far enough in the commission's proposal. Are there any changes to that, that you, you would like to see? This is a very important point for us. So let's, let's, let's start from the, from, from, from the beginning. First of all, it was super important for us and super positive for us that the commission at least took the principle of know your business customer, a principle that emanated from the European Parliament that we have pushed and it was a red line, both for myself as a rapporteur, but also for my political group, because ultimately it doesn't make sense that in this day and age, um, we have business transactions which hide behind the principle of anonymity. Is that enough? The commission's proposal, I think that, the, that it is a half-baked proposal, I don't believe that this should be restricted only to online marketplaces, but it should cover uh, all digital services. It's not a question because there were argumentations and, and, and arguments doing the rounds that this may be too bureaucratic, it will be difficult to implement, but we already have an number. First of all, it's, it's as a principle, it's already there under Article 5 of the current uh, e-commerce directive. The only thing that is missing is having that verification element. But ultimately, in the VAT system and also in other, in other systems, we already can have this verification element which can be ultimately checked without imposing um, onerous conditions that would be difficult or too onerous, which would ultimately affect the competitivity, for example, of our players, uh, of uh, intermediaries. So I think this, is, this can be achieved. The Commission's proposal is a good proposal, but it's a half-baked proposal that I believe should and must be more ambitious. And definitely, I will also be pushing forward amendments in that direction. Thank you, Alex. Now, to broaden the discussion um, to disinformation, Edward Butler asks, by looking to address the uh, issue of disinformation in legal content, does the panel agree with the need for the DSA to create a clear distinction between commercial and political slash other non-commercial advertising. You know, he, he then goes on to say commercial advertising is regulated in accordance with EU law and subject to sub-regulatory advising codes, whereas political non-commercial advertising is subject to differing regulation to the EU. And in several EU member states, it's not regulated at all. So perhaps um, we could take your view on that, starting with you, with you Sabina. I think it's very important to, to, to discuss uh, uh, about the transparency we, we need in these, these advertisement field. Uh, when it comes to political advertisement, it must be clear, uh, follow the money principle uh, uh, to know who is paying for what kind of information, especially when it comes uh, to political interferences. Um, uh, we discussed that already uh, several times also in the Inge committee. And uh, I think it's very important to, to, uh, to come here with a different approach to regular advertisement, to, advertisement tools. I think that uh, uh, know your customer and know who is uh, behind something uh, has two sides. Um, there is a, a big noise uh, in the background that's uh, quite irritating, sorry. Um, 
I think it is it is it is very important that we um, uh, know not just uh, also that the platforms, uh, uh, like uh, uh, it was said before, the platforms know a lot of their customers when it comes to the private users, uh, because they they uh, get informations over the cookies over over other uh, uh, information tools, uh, so that they uh, also with the targeted uh, uh, um, uh, to make targeted advertisement, uh, but on the other hand, uh, they very often show. Uh, uh, that they or say that they don't know their business partners. And I think uh, that must be clear that there must be more transparency in the uh, uh, business to business relation between the platforms and the service providers. And uh, this must be also accessible uh, when it comes to, to illegal content, when it comes to, uh, uh, to disinformation, when it comes to hate speech, uh, that we really have a possibility to have more transparency and to have more control over who is behind uh, such a campaign. And I think that is uh, something that must be uh, said very clear in the text. Uh, we will have to discuss if, if it's already enough what's, uh, what is in the proposal of the Commission. I think the Parliament will work on this uh, very intensively because I don't see the big differences between the political groups uh, that we really want more transparency, uh, especially when it comes to political information or disinformation, uh, that transparency is the clue uh, to, to to get, uh, like we say in German, uh, the foot into the door so that they cannot close it, uh, which was uh, in the past always the case uh, when we wanted to, to, to come up. Uh, many platforms said, uh, no, we cannot give the data of our customers, we don't have the data, and they made, made a close job out of this so that to, to follow the money was very, very difficult for us and really to, 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 to get an insight who is standing behind disinformation and uh, sometimes also behind illegal content like hate speech or incitement to terrorism. And Sabina, uh, just to follow up, we have a question from Molly Nolan. Uh, she, may, uh, she states that you mentioned that stakeholders should have a say in technical and legislative process. And she asked what processes are there in uh, what processes are there in place for um, stakeholders to engage with DSA, DSM, and she's questioned whether there'll be consultation opportunities in the future. Are you able to say anything on that at all? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm already in a close exchange with several stakeholders. Uh, we are also in offline time, in online times, uh, open for exchanges. Uh, what I plan for my opinion is also to make uh, stakeholder meetings. I know that there were consultations from the Commission beforehand, uh, where everyone could give its input uh, before the legislation came out, and we are in the regular processes. Um, and uh, there are always via the um, rapporteurs, shadow rapporteurs, members of parliament, the possibilities for stakeholder to engage uh, in the process and to discuss um, and uh, bring out the arguments. But what, what we are planning or what I am planning uh, for the next month uh, for our opinion is uh, that I want to organize via Zoom or WebEx or what platform ever, uh, meetings with several stakeholders like we did it in the AVMS. I don't know if you remember that we made stakeholder meetings for the AVMS where we included the, uh, all the shadow rapporteurs, where we included uh, not just one stakeholder at the same time, but several stakeholders, because I thought uh, for us it was very uh, interesting also to see um, when uh, you invite groups of stakeholders to discuss, um, it's uh, uh, very often not just the, the position that is specific from the one company, but it's a more broader approach which we want to, to, to get, uh, because we cannot make uh, a company specific legislation we want to make a factual uh, uh, specific uh, legislation on, on different situations. And uh, I think that is uh, uh, a good way to do so. And uh, we are trying to organize that for the next month because until summer, we will have time to come up with our, um, uh, with our um, opinion. And uh, I want to do it in a very open and transparent way to have this exchange also with all types of stakeholders, with consumers, with uh, uh, users of the platform, 
as service providers, but also with the platforms as such, with regulators, uh, also to find uh, the balance between the sector specific legislation that we also have to discuss uh, if the wording of the of the legislative text that is proposed at the moment uh, does not have an interference with existing legislation and i think it's important that we always uh, uh, try to be as transparent as possible also from the political side uh, not just to uh, oblige platforms to be transparent thank you thank you very much Sabine. and if i could bring in emmanuel as well um commission vice president of Astea, has earmarked the spring of 2022 for an agreement between the institutions to be finalised. Do you think this is realistic? So very interesting question. Um, I think that the short answer is yes, probably it is realistic. Um, uh, I would provide two reasons for that. The first reason is that on the, for what concerns the work that the European Parliament um, is doing and the European Parliament has been done with the own initiative rappers that came out uh, repeatedly uh, during today's discussion, the European Parliament already established the pillars of its position on this DSA proposal. Of course, a lot of work um, will need to be done on the details of the proposals, but perhaps this will facilitate um, the process and hopefully allow the Parliament to um, vote in the plenary on a report in December. When it comes to the Council, the Portuguese presidency has been moving forward quite fastly with the article by article discussion. Um, they will not um, work on a general approach, but they are working on a progress report to be presented on the 28th of May. And following up on that, then it will be up to the Slovenian and the French presidency, presidency to um, present um, a general approach to start the interinstitutional negotiations. Now, I think. It's also interesting to consider that in the previous legislative term, we had some very controversial um, procedures that the institutions managed to clear in 14 months, such as the platform to business regulation, for instance. So it is a realistic objective. At the same time, um, we need to be mindful of the fact that, again, the detail, the devil really is in the detail when it comes to this proposal. Um, so we shouldn't be surprised either if, uh, due to the complexity of the, of the discussions, the proposal is delayed. And as a reminder, the copyright directive that also we mentioned repeatedly today took 31 months. So um, I hope that answers your question. Absolutely, that's that's um, exactly the kind of um, you know uh, insight that we that we really 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 appreciate. Thank you very much. I have a question for Alex now. Um, with France pushing for the inclusion of harmful content in the DSA scope, is the European Commission's definition of illegal versus harmful content sufficient enough? As a baseline, yes. Um, uh, I think uh, we would have created much more uncertainty um, if we expanded our focus also to harmful content. It's, uh, uh, as we always say, it's already tricky to find a common denominator when it comes to uh, illegal content in 27 different member states. What's illegal in Malta may not be illegal in Germany. So it's already tricky to move in that direction. I believe that the focus by mentioning specifically particular priorities when it comes to illegal content that we should prioritize our work in, um, such as counterfeit, such as uh, terrorist content, such as uh, child abuse of sexual material. I think uh, it's a step in the right direction, but uh, at the same time, I think that we have to be aware that this initiative, although we have many issues when it comes to the ecosystem, challenges that we have that have been there for a number of years now, we should and we must not treat these two initiatives, the DSA and DMA, as that silver bullet, which can tackle all the problems that we have at hand. So we should prioritize our work, I think, um, as a baseline, let's say, good um, a direction that, that the Commission uh, is taking in its initiative when it comes to illegal versus harmful content. Um, obviously, the devil is in the detail. There are some issues that we may also move some suggestions to have the text which is more clear uh, in this regard but I think uh, 
that as a baseline, yes, I think that the, the, the distinction that the focus is right. Thank you, Alex. And a question for Sabino from Thomas uh, Bergman. He asks, you have mentioned um, the relationship between DSA and sector specific uh, regulation. Why is this a concern? And do you think that this is already sufficiently addressed in the Commission's proposal? Um, I give you one example. When it comes, for example, to audiovisual content, which is uh, in the classic broadcaster systems, but also uh, uh, on media platforms, uh, on video sharing platforms, and so on, there are already included in sector specific uh, legislation in the AVMS where we laid down already very clear measures uh, to protect uh, youngsters, to have transparency rules when it comes to advertisement, uh, to have uh, uh, in the audiovisual sector, a common approach between classic broadcasting uh, via air and uh, uh, the, the digital side of the broadcasting or the audiovisual services uh, uh, world. Uh, and if we now come up with uh, this new piece of legislation, which does not fit or brings additional burdens, for example, for example, uh, audiovisual services are already controlled uh, by the uh, 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 author national authorities and by the ARGA as a European uh, corporation uh, of national authorities uh, in, the, in the media scene. So if you now again make an, another additional body that controls, that is not just undue, bur uh, undue burden, but it's also a uh, double control that might be contradictory in the end. And that is something we have to, to take care uh, that the legislation does not contradict each other, that it supports each other, and that uh, is the new legislation is not overruling existing and freshly imple implemented legislation uh, that is sector specific and very needed in specific sectors. Because you would not just have the digital world inside, but you also must find fair conditions when it comes to online and offline offers of the same uh, type of content. And, and that is the reason why we uh, have to be very careful in this case. Thank you. Now, do you believe there are sort of elements of the Commission's proposal, um, and this goes to Sabine and Alex, that you require greater clarification? Um, are there, is there anything that stands out that you think perhaps wasn't consulted on enough um, prior to the uh, proposal uh, publication in December? If I could go to Alex first, perhaps. Maybe, if I may, I think one of the, one of the issues that definitely for me needs uh, more clarity, for example, is, is the issue of trusted flaggers and the notice and action um, procedure, I think. It's, it's, it's a good start um, as, a, as a proposal, the focus on, on trusted flaggers, but at the same time, I think that when it comes to the definitions and when it comes to uh, ultimately the power that we are uh, going to put in the hands of these trusted flaggers and the whole uh, notice and action framework, I think we should be more clear because ultimately this can have, uh, if we have a too wide definition, we can have many negative repercussions. So um, I think that we should uh, do much more in that regard. Thank you. Yeah, and for me, I think it's, it's very important also to be more clear in uh, the classification of platforms. Um, if you have active plas platforms, which are really dealing with the content, which are aggregating, which are uh, working uh, on the content as such, uh, uh, and if you have a really passive platforms which don't have any impact in the dissemination and distribute, uh, not the distribution, but in the aggregation of the content. And also the distinction and the clear definition between what is a small and medium-sized enterprise in the online world, or what is a big platform, sometimes also smaller platforms, can be uh, uh, important, especially when it comes to hate speech or uh, terrorism. And uh, there we have to be clear which obligations also smaller platform have uh, when it comes really to, to very harmful content like uh, 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 um, incitement to terrorism and other things or, or child protection and, and so on. Uh, so uh, we have to be very clear in which way uh, uh, these distinctions are made in the uh, in the general approach of the directive and uh, we have to be uh, clear um, 
on uh, uh, the responsibilities. It cannot be just the size, because otherwise uh, those who are misusing platforms for their disinformation or for uh, child abuse or for uh, illegal content like, like uh, um, uh, incitement to terrorism or hate speech, uh, they can also whip over to uh, uh, swi uh, uh, switch over to the smaller platforms and use several smaller platforms that where they are not controlled in an adequate way. So we need uh, a, a clear approach also to which type of content all platforms have to, uh, to be responsible or more responsible than in the past. And uh, where content is not as harmful, uh, that we can have different uh, approaches uh, in the liability of the platform as such. But that must be defined in a very clear structure because otherwise we create loopholes for those who want to misuse. And that is something where we also have to work on. Thank you, Sabina. And Emmanuel, um, if I could ask you a, a question, looking ahead to the institutional negotiations, now we've discussed France's um, uh, request that uh, the, the definition of illegal content, and including harmful content, into the, into the file is, 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 is uh, discussed. But what are the other significant areas of contention that you believe there might be between the EP and the Council um, going forward beyond December when we expect the European Parliament's mandate to to be confirmed? Again, I think another very interesting question. Um, from the point of view of an observer, perhaps I can provide my educated guess on the top three uh, most contentious issues that will characterize the, the negotiations between the Parliament, the Commission, and the Council. Um, funnily enough, all these items were actually already mentioned in the conversation by the MPs, and perhaps that demonstrates uh, the importance of this discussion. And, how contentious these, are, these issues can be. But first of all, I would say the proposal to include um, a ban on target advertisement in general, it's something which I believe will be uh, very contentious during the negotiations. Mm -hmm. That is the case because this was already mentioned by the parliament in one of the own initiative records. Um, it is something that is backed by some NGOs. At the same time, some industry, um, some, some segments of the industry oppose the idea to include a ban on tech advertisement. And some member states, actually to my understand, no member state has clearly made up its mind about um, banning targeted ads. So I think this is something that would likely be very controversial. The second could perhaps be the special liability regime, MEP uh, Saliba just mentioned. This is something that is again, incredibly important for the European parliament. It is backed by many NGOs, but also by some segments in the industry, such as brand owners, as I was mentioning in my introductory remarks. In the case of, um, of the special liability regime for online marketplaces, it's also interesting to notice that there are some member states that wouldn't mind seeing um, a similar framework in the context of the DSA. Um, However, I think that the, commission, um, the Commission's mind about this um, is that it's difficult to distinguish between um, social networks and other forms of hosting services providers, such as online marketplaces. So the discussion is very technical, and that would be something that for sure um, MEPs will need to, to, to discuss uh, extensively with the European Commission in the negotiations. And finally, the third point, which I think is a bit more general, concerns the balance between harmful, um, the, the necessity to remove harmful content and the importance to protect freedom of speech. To be clear, the entire DSA proposal is about striking a balance between conflicting goals. So for instance, the goal of protecting and developing the European tech industry and the goal of making sure that transactions are safe for consumers and do not cause uh, harm to anyone. Um, but I think that when it comes to the debate between um, harmful content, the, the necessity to balance protection for users and to remove harmful content. Um, this concerns fundamental rights is of course something that is extremely contentious by definition. And some member states have already adopted in um, their national jurisprudence some measures that concern um, tackling forms of harmful content. Um, we know that for the European Parliament, protecting fundamental freedoms, especially freedom of speech is something important. Um, so this balance is something that, again, 
uh, I think would be subject to intense negotiations. And then on top of that, we could discuss, you know, other many other things. But um, I think the intersection between sectoral role and DSA it's incredibly interesting. We didn't mention today, um, but it's absolutely important to keep in mind that the DSA is proposed in the context of other legislative initiatives, such as the General Product Safety Directive, the political consultation on targeted advertisement on uh, political advertisement. Um, at, by the end of the year, the European Commission would publish something to expand the list of or to include arm, some forms of hate speech in um, in the definition of illegal uh, content. So all, all these initiatives are also very interesting and could be contentious, but um, perhaps probably worth stopping here. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Um, I have one last question for both Sabina and Alex, um, just before, before we wrap up. The App Association has warned that the frequent reassessment of very large online platforms could stifle innovation and growth. With Europe wanting to transform itself into a digital powerhouse, do you think this is a concern? If I could start with uh, Alex, perhaps. Sorry, I missed a bit your question because the, the, the connection was not that good. Okay, no worries, I can read it again. The App Association has warned that the frequent reassessments of very large online platforms could stifle innovation and growth. Would yeah, you okay. Want to... okay. So yes, uh, definitely. I think that the DMA is a very ambitious instrument, first of all. I think even when it comes to defining who these players are, uh, and also with regards to the commission's proposal of the, of the do's and don'ts list, I think it's a ambitious and it's really important that in this day and age we realize that traditional competition law, EU traditional competition law by itself cannot create a more competitive and more contestable online environment. We see a number of issues that we have that, has, that have been there that cannot be resolved by ex post measures alone. Therefore, this ex ante instrument, which in my opinion is more preventive than basically uh, trying to solve the situation when ultimately it's too late and there is already there are already competition problems on the market i think it's 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 a good proposal again there are some issues that we have to look at for example the effect that this proposal will not only have on big tech giants but ultimately will also have a ripple effect on smaller players on SMEs, I think this is also an important point that maybe the Commission didn't focus so much attention upon. And I think that the Europe, as a European Parliament, we have to be more focused also on the ripple effects of the DMA. But ultimately, I believe that this, this instrument is of fundamental importance. It is pretty much in the same um, line as also uh, we in the in the internal market committee have proposed when it comes to the digital market set uh, dealing with systemic players having a gatekeeper role but ultimately i think it is a step in the right direction and the step that we should take we must take ultimately to regain that control to ultimately also to stand up for big tech who are ultimately um, dictating the rules upon which they uh, function with. So uh, yes, it's of fundamental importance to define and to put um, uh, more responsibility uh, on these players to create a more contestable environment. Thank you, Alex. And before we wrap up, Sabine, perhaps I'll give you a last word on that. Yeah, I think uh, I can I can underline uh, also what uh, 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 what was said before, and uh, but but for me it is also important to be careful with uh, uh, preventive control of of, of content, uh, because we always have the discussions uh, and coming from cult committee we have this discussion very often uh, uh, that we have to be quite careful. Uh, not to uh, undermine uh, freedom of ex expression and freedom of speech. Knowing that illegal content is not covered by freedom of speech or freedom of expression, um, uh, but it's always difficult to, to have a general approach of pre-controlling. Um, but what is very important is uh, that we, uh, in the measures that are taken uh, with uh, notice uh, and action, uh, there is also the part of notice and stay down. So there we need the pre-control of content when we already have defined content 
as something uh, illegal or uh, services as uh, harmful or other things. Uh, there we have to, to enable companies uh, also with technical measures to, to stay down and uh, to, 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 to help to, uh, that this stays down. And also uh, the responsibility for that must be there. So um, I don't see that it is a measurement to hinder or to block development, new ideas, uh, but it is, I think, uh, um, uh, uh, a framework in which companies and new ideas and new services can develop. And uh, this uh, uh, is set up uh, by a consensus in society, and that is what we are working on, clearly to define what is in the con uh, consensus uh, of, of what is acceptable and what's not acceptable or uh, a development in a direction we don't want to go to without blocking um, uh, new ideas and uh, uh, new things coming up. Thank you very much. And sadly, that is all we have time for today. I would like to thank all the participants, Sabina, Alex and Emmanuel, and of course, yourselves, the audience, for tuning in and putting some fine questions across so I can get to them all. I would also like to thank my colleagues, Josh Dell and Chris Martin, for all their hard work in putting this event together. The broadcast will be available on Dehab in the EU social media very soon, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the morning. Goodbye, and thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.